Um, again, welcome everyone. Welcome class of 2020. Thank you so much for, uh, for tuning in today. Um, I am very honored to have a special guest on the call with us today, our founder and CEO, Peter Gassner. Um, I hope that today will be informative. Um, you'll learn something new. It will open your perspectives about different career paths and hopefully we'll get to all of the great questions that everyone submitted in advance. Um, so what I wanted to do today is first introduce um, the people on the call. For myself, in case you hear my voice in the background, my name is Anka. Um, I am currently the program director for one of our new grad programs here at Viva, our consultant development program. So I will serve as the MC um, today, but my guest is Peter. I'm so excited to have Peter on this call, founder and CEO, um, and learn a lot more about, um, about Peter. Um, I wanted to clarify with the format of this session so people know what to expect and we know what's, what's coming next. Um, Peter will talk a bit about Viva, um, talk about how we started, what we do, who we are, and give everyone an overview. And this is really hearing it from the person who created the company. Um, and then Peter will talk um, about, again, career opportunities and what do we actually do for new grads. We'll do a fireside chat and hopefully ask Peter some questions to get him talking about Viva's contribution to the sector and about our new graduate programs. And then the most important part of today is actually getting to your questions. Um, thank you all so much for submitting a lot of insightful questions. We have a lot of time dedicated to, um, to your questions. Now, as a little surprise, um, Peter definitely enjoys creating connections with people. Um, so when, we will, when I will call out your, your question, I will introduce who submitted the question, where are you from, what you, where you've graduated from, um, what your major is. And then we will actually promote you to panelists. So you can actually have a dialogue um, with Peter. Cameras on, hopefully people feel comfortable, um, but definitely trying to make it a bit more, more personal. So uh, without further ado on, on my end, Peter, I want to hand it over to you as you are the, the special guest today. And I will stop sharing my screen to, to let you do that. All right, thanks, Taka. Let me share my screen to get us going. All right, let me start here. Uh, I guess, first of all, just, you know, welcome to everybody. I'll, I'll stop sharing here. I think, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining. There's 40 some participants. Uh, I want you to get you guys comfortable and get something visual you can put in your head. So imagine we're sitting in a room and it's at, at one of your great universities. I think the favorite place I like at some universities, it's maybe, uh, a dorm area or a common meeting place where there's like a, a big lounge and you're kind of all sitting in chairs, maybe not like an audience seating, kind of just, you know, sitting on couches and stuff. And I'm up at the front and I'm sitting in a nice comfy chair. And there's that, you know, some of you got a beer or some of you got some tea or whatever. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, we can't, I would love to be doing that with you guys. That would be super fun, but I'm not. I'm sitting at home at my desk here, COVID thing like everybody else, but that should be the mood that you're in. All right, we're having a, a nice in-person meeting here. And now I'll tell you a little bit the basics about Viva. So the things to know, we're about 4,000 people in Viva. Um, we serve, let's see if this is working here. Oh, this slide's not working too well. Um, what do we do? We, we serve the life sciences industry. So we make software and, and consulting and data for the life sciences industry. The way to think about that is the life sciences industry are the people that make medicine, medicine and medical products like medical devices. So if you're a doctor, you deeply care about your patients. That's sort of what you do and you you do it day in and day out. And if some of you know doctors, you know that that's a pretty serious calling. They, you know, they have to go, yes, they have to get a university degree, but the whole medical degree and the internship, the residency, et cetera, it's a serious calling and you're there to take care of patients. And part of that is listening to patients and understanding what's, what's going through their mind. But part of that is also the technology you bring to solve, as a doctor to solve the patient's problem. A lot of times that goes, that's a medicine or a medical procedure. And that comes from companies 
that are our customers. So it could be small biotechs working on a very specific disease. It could be large pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer or Novartis or, or, or Amgen. So the life sciences industry is made up of about 2 million people roughly worldwide that are making medicines and, and medical procedures for doctors. We make very specific technology to help them do their job of, of making medicines, designing medicines, getting medicines approved, bringing medicines to market in a legal way all around the world. So that's what we do. And we have about 4,000 people at Viva doing that. Uh, so it's pretty important, like medicines are important. And I remember one time I, I really realized that by uh, talking to a doctor at a conference and he was an older doctor, he's probably about 80. And he said, when I was a young guy, just starting out as an intern, I was at a large city hospital and there was one floor that was dedicated to uh, polio patients. And they had polio, we couldn't do anything for them, but we had to make them as comfortable as they can. And we knew some of them were gonna lose the, you know, the ability to use their arm or their leg or their both legs. And we really couldn't do anything for them, but we have to be compassionate to them. But since, because of the advancements of medicine during his lifetime, they don't have that anymore. They don't have the whole floor of people with polio. They have a vaccine that basically stopped it. And my adopted grandfather had polio. He, he only was able to use one arm um, because he had polio. Uh, he never felt sorry for himself, but his life was more difficult. Every, like driving a car was more difficult. Chopping wood was more difficult. You know, defending himself in a fight was more difficult. Everything was more difficult. So I feel pretty good that um, we're helping these people that make medicines, that helps doctors do their job better and, and contributes to society. So that's what we do. We have about 4,000 people doing it. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay, we're founded in 2007. So we're, what does that make us, 13 years old? That is the definition of a teenager. And we're kind of a teenage company. We got a lot of wild ideas. We kind of know what we're doing, but we're not all the way grown up yet. And we are a public company, about $1.5 billion in revenue. So one of the more successful public companies. I like this, this picture it was made by one of the people at Viva just decided to make it. This is our headquarters in the background and, and our, our name here, Viva and 4,000 people. When we crossed the 4,000 people mark, they made this collage out of the images of all 4,000 people and they posted it to our internal social network and it's kind of become a thing each person tries to go through and pick and find their image which is kind of hard there's no easy way to do it you have to go one by one by one by one so the reason why i like to show this is this is really viva viva is four thousand people all with their great ideas and differences and but sharing a common culture and a common set of values and kind of a common way of thinking so we might have a product support person in Columbus, Ohio. We might have a engineer in Boston. We might have a salesperson in Paris. And we might have people working on a lot of different products. Um, but we all share a common set of values and visions and, and kind of get along with each other. Um, and, and it's a team. Um, Viva is not a set of individuals. It's a team and we can accomplish team goals. So that's one team. If you come to Viva, you'd be joining this team. You know, maybe we'll have a Viva 5000 collage at some point, and maybe you would have to hunt for your picture in there. <laughs> uh, do you know where your picture is, Anka? You know I what? haven't. I was actually thinking about that because I uh, haven't okay. well, been able to find myself. It'll take a while. You won't be able to find it on this picture. I haven't actually looked on where mine is because I haven't had enough time with us COVID. I'll have to find it someday. Right, this is another team you would join, which is the, this is the US Generation Viva team. This picture was taken uh, last year, roughly about this time in Denver when we did our Generation Viva offsite. It's a mix of engineers and consultants. There's people in the background, it's, it's about 200 people. So these are the people that have been, that joined out of university and they've been here. They had been here one or two, two years. I, I was there at this event. I know some of the people, but not all of the people. So that's another, another group you would join at Viva. 
Um, let me stop sharing there now. I guess my point is when you're when you're joining Viva or you're joining a company, yes, it is somewhat about the work. You will have things to do, right? Because everybody has to contribute. But you're also maybe knowingly or unknowingly, you're joining a um, social structure um, and you're getting friends um, and you're learning from those friends. And those probably going to last on. Hopefully, if you would stay at Viva and do well at Viva for, I don't know, five years or so, those things will last on whether you're at Viva or not at Viva. Um, that lasted with me in my career. I started my career in a, in a group of IBM and, and I still know a lot of those folks. In fact, three of them work at Viva actually. So, you know, these are friends that stay with you. And so Anka, do I get to start by interviewing you? Absolutely, let's make this yeah. fun, Peter. Right, right before this. I, uh, I told Anka, hey, instead of you interviewing me, which I'll let you do later, but I'm going to start it out by interviewing Anka. All right. I'm not a very good interviewer, but I'll try. So Anka, tell me a bit about yourself. Um, what happened to you in your first 18 years of life? Where are you from? How did you get to be you in your first 18 years of life? Um, so I'm originally from Europe, by the way. Everyone cannot be confused by my accent. I'm not American. Um, I come from Eastern Europe. Romania is a fairly small country in Eastern Europe. Um, I left home when I was 18. My parents pushed me really hard to go and study abroad and go outside of Romania. Um, I went to the UK for my first two years of college. I was a business major. Um, I liked technology. I had done programming in high school, but I wasn't really sure what my path was going to be. So I started out in the UK. Um, my lifelong dream was to live in France at some point, even though I didn't speak a lick of French. Um, so I actually moved to France for my last two years of college and learned French as I was going through my French college courses. Now why, why France? Did you have an uncle living in France or you saw a picture of France one day or you're a wine lover or how did that happen? I was too young to be a wine lover. I know Europeans are, are different, but I was too young for that. Um, my dad used to work for uh, Philips back in the day. And they had a really big office and HQ outside of Paris in Le Mans. Uh -huh. so for two summers in a row, when my dad had to go and work there for two, three weeks, he took my mom and myself with him. Uh -huh. So I spent, when I was 13 and 14, I spent a couple of weeks just walking around and exploring and just fell in love with France completely. Uh -huh. Do you still like France? I still love France. It will always have a special place in my heart. I lived there for about 10 years almost. Um, oh. And then just quickly, how do you find Viva? You know, Viva, what year did you find Viva and how did you find it? Um, so Viva was my first job out of college. I can absolutely relate to everyone here on the call. Um, I was 22 when I started at Viva eight years ago. I was the youngest person in Viva Europe. Um, I loved the technology side and that's what appealed to me. I believed in our product, but I found my family, like you were saying. Um, Viva Paris adopted me. My closest friends to this day in life are people that I started with in that office. Um, and Viva gave me more chances to grow than any other company would have, not when I was 22 and I didn't really know the industry. So hopefully we can give, and I can give some of that back through our CDP program. And what was your first job? Um, what, you know, when you arrived at Viva, what, what were you responsible? What did you have to do? I was a technical trainer. Um, so my responsibility was teaching clients and consultants how to configure our software. Here you are, 22 years old, teaching people who are 30, 40, 50 years old. Uh, was it, it intimidating? I think I didn't realize how much I didn't know early on. Are you going to say that? Because I never felt you were intimidated by anything. You just sort of go for it. Eva gave me that chance. People taught me and people took the time to teach me. So that was my first job. Um, I grew the team for training in Europe and then starting CDP in Europe um, and hopefully building, you know, great associates. How old were you when you did your first management job managing people? Um, 25. 25. Pretty early, right? Very, very early. But Viva never cared about my age, which I absolutely always loved and appreciated. Yeah, I think we didn't care about your age. We didn't care about where you're from your gender or whatever, you just, you know, it's about contribution. And what, what we saw in Anka was, hey, this person that she makes it happen every day, focuses on contribution, focuses on being the best she can, trusts her management, helps everybody else be better, and, uh, and is ready for the challenge. So, and now you live in New York. Uh, you probably didn't plan to live there exactly during COVID, right? 
Um, no, but it's been interesting. I moved over about a year ago and thank you again, Peter, for the amazing opportunity to support CDP globally. And my other dream when I was a child was to be a lawyer in America when I was 10 years old. So I missed the lawyer part, but I got the America part right. So I'm super excited to, to live out the other part of my dream. And what languages can you speak? Um, Romanian, although I'm slightly losing it, English, French, and half of German, I would say. What, say something to people in Romanian so they know what it sounds like. Mă bucur că sunteți toți astăzi cu noi în, în meeting. Well, meeting is English, but... And what did that mean? I said I'm very happy that everyone's here today with us in the meeting. Very cool. All right. So that's Anka. Um, that's one of the 4,000 people that make Viva great by bringing her diversity, her energy, her focus on co contribution, and actually her intelligence, you know, and her willing to learn. Um, and being around people like Anka is kind of infectious, you know, you kind of, okay, you want to do good and you enjoy it when you're around good people. So, all right, sorry, that was a longer interview than we planned. Um, we'll I guess I'm trying, to delay, I'm trying to delay the interview of me. <laughs> we'll turn the tables, but stay on the same topic in a way. You asked me about my career start. Um, I think everyone on this call as they're trying to get into the workforce would really love knowing a bit more about how you started your career and that first job out of college and how did that help set your course for, uh, for your life? Uh, okay, well, I'm uh, the basics, just like you, you know, everybody has a basic story of some things that formed them in their early life. I'm uh, Swiss Americans. My parents were Swiss from the German part of Switzerland, uh, immigrants in the 50s. Um, I was born in the US in Oregon. Uh, so third of six kids. Uh, my dad had a machine shop and I was always very good at mechanical things and mathematical things. Uh, English tortured me, but math was easy you know, when I was growing up. So one thing led to another and a high school teacher said, hey, study, you know, look at this thing called programming. It might be good for you. Cause I was always in more of the mechanical things like welding and stuff like that. So I took a, a little class in high school. I thought oh, that might be good. And then I, and then I, um, I just got a computer science degree and did a bunch of interesting adventures in my youth. Uh, Took about six years to get through university because I was doing all kinds of things and traveling and living in strange places and doing strange jobs and adventuring. But when I settled down to work, I sort of thought, oh, okay, I'm really going to settle down to work now. And I got a job at IBM in, in Silicon Valley in a group inside of IBM doing software engineering of a certain type. Didn't really know what I was doing or really what I should focus on, actually. I just know, oh my goodness, these folks are gonna pay me to do a job, so I better do my best, you know, because that's sort of what my father taught me. He had this term he called a paying job. And ever since I was young, like if you give me a dollar to wash the car, it's like, that's a paying job. Or when I got my first job, you know, and then working in his machine shop too, very young, you know, eight or nine, 10, 11, 12, first sweeping this floor and then doing the machines, you know, he would pay me by the hour and he would say, you got a paying job, you better do your best. And then I always remember that when I got my first paying job that wasn't for my father, other than mowing lawns and stuff, washing dishes in a restaurant. I remember thinking, and I, these guys are paying me, I, be, I better do my best. And I had that same idea when I went to IBM, like, oh man, they're paying me and it's a lot more than what I was making washing dishes too, <laughs> you know? So, I better do my best. And that was just my mindset. I, I better do my best, better contribute. And I did, I, I worked in software engineering, ha ended up working around some really great people. And I did my best and it was a job I could do well because I, I was good at that kind of software engineering thing. If they would have asked me to write English papers at that point of, you know, 25 years old, I probably would have worked hard, but also failed because I was not good at that. So I worked really hard. And I did well, and that's kind of made my career, that kind of made my career very satisfying because I, I was around people that were good, that thought I was doing a good job. You know, I got promoted, I got more responsibility, and it ended up, you know, that's sort of how I started Viva again. That's so, then my career was just formed by where I started, around good people, doing a job I could do well, and I, and I worked hard at it, and then I developed a network of reputation, and. Uh, it wasn't, that's just, that's all, it, that's all it was.
All right, I don't even know what question you asked, but that was a long answer. That was a good question. It's how you started off in the job market and well, what was the first step. Um, so thank you for that, Peter. Um, now to stay on the same topic of jumpstarting one's career, can you tell us a bit about um, your decision to start Generation Viva and all of our new graduate programs um, here? And how do you see those programs and all these recent grads contributing to Viva's future? Yeah, we started Viva in 2007. No, I would guess I was about 40, a little, little bit over 40, and uh, the, a lot of the folks I knew were my similar age. My kids were in grade school at the time. Um, a lot of the people that I knew were sort of between 35 and 45, and uh, I didn't know a lot of college graduates, right? So we had, you know, the first five, six, seven, eight people were all sort of 35 to 45, and then I started thinking, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> we need some diversity here. We need some young folks. So we're we wanted to hire some young folks, but we didn't know any. And it was kind of hard. It's not like, you know, when you have a startup of eight people, you don't have a college recruiting program or something like that. So I literally was reaching out to all the people I knew that were my age or older that says, do you have any children or know any people that are graduating? <laughs> you know? So our first, our first one was actually the son of a friend of mine. I'm like, okay, he's young. He must be nice. Let's hire him. <laughs> so, so, and then it's sort of, we had this tradition of, yeah, we have to have young folks coming into the company. And then when we started growing a bit more, I think this was around 2012 or so, maybe 13, when we formalized, we said, wow, we, we really need to make a program around this. And this is going to be our future generation Viva. And it's also going to be a great thing for the industry, for the people making medicine. If we bring a bunch of young folks in that get enthused about that, um, that'll be a great gift to the world and the industry. And, and it turns out to be a real good thing for Viva and, uh, and a good thing. I, and I feel good about it because it often starts off people like yourself uh, good in their career. And it just makes it interesting too. And mainly I love to go to the Generation Viva offsite every year. So how about that? Great answer. We always love having you there. Um, but I, I think it's the interesting. The first one was in my hometown. The first one was in Portland, Oregon. And we brought the whole Generation Viva group on a walking tour through the little neighborhood I grew up in and saw like the house where I grew up in and the, the house of my first girlfriend and my dad's machine shop and stuff like that. It was pretty fun for me. Pretty, I think it was fun for the group too. I'm the whole neighborhood is a small neighborhood. They were wondering like, why are these 200 people walking around the neighborhood? And some of them came out of their doors to ask us, like, what is this? What's going on? <laughs> it was pretty fun. I heard great stories. Again, I'm jealous that I missed that one event, but I'm sure we can make up for it. Um, I think it. it's interesting what you said about the new generation and helping the overall industry. Can you explain a bit what you mean, kind of going beyond Viva, but how are we contributing to the industry through this? Yeah, the, the life sciences industry, you know, a couple million people and it's doing really important stuff like you, it's always been doing important stuff, but I think people can kind of really understand it now, right? One of the things they're doing is trying to make a COVID vaccine therapies, treatments and vaccines like that's super important for people's happiness, for the economy, etc. So the more people that get started in and around this industry, the more and the better people, the, the better we're going to be able to help, you know, improve and extend human life because the industry is just the people. That's all. None of this technology or inventions or Nobel prizes or whatever, it doesn't just make itself. It's all made by people. And so we're part of that industry. We're the technology part of it, but that's a super important part of the industry. Thank so for example, there's people at Vivo working on software to make it easier for patients and more enjoyable and faster for patients to participate in the clinical trial. So that's a direct input right there. That's a perfect segue, Peter. We've lined it up perfectly. Um, a lot of the questions that were submitted by the audience were around Viva's contributions to the sector. Um, now Viva's had a lot of um, innovation that we brought into the technology side. Could you talk about one or two examples of innovations that supported the industry, especially during the health crisis that we're all dealing with right now? Yeah, there's, there's so many examples. So the industry, they, they use, I'll just a couple examples. They use one of our applications to help them manufacture medicines to understand what are the policies and procedures when you manufacture a medicine 
because there's two things if you don't if you don't follow those policies and procedures one is it's actually illegal and you'll your company will maybe not your whole company but at least that product will get shut down by the health authorities because the second part is it's very dangerous so for Matt imagine you're making a medicine that's a biologic that's a grown organism if you don't follow the procedures correctly um, you you could likely kill people right? because it's going directly into the bloodstream so it's super super serious stuff and sometimes you you know that might not be apparent you might inject people they might start dying three months from now and it's too late to unwind the thing so it's super important so one of the applications we have um, it's basically around the control of the processes around that of, of manufacturing medicine so the, you know and that's it's a cloud-based system and when many things have to become more remote our systems have to keep running so people can keep making medicine and so i'm very very proud of that one and then we did some special projects too we stood up some systems very quickly in the uk to help um, a consortium of companies from you know dyson vacuum cleaners all the in the formula one company all these companies got together to um, make a different type of ventilator very quickly um, to make thousands of these ventilators very quickly and safely and we stood up some the guys the team worked you know seven days a week, basically 24 hours a day to, to set up the systems because this is a group, a company that formed from a bunch of different companies. They didn't have a way to collaborate. Um, so we, we did that for them. And we've done many, many things, but those are a couple of examples. Thank you, Peter. Again, a lot of questions were around this area. You know, what are we doing to support the industry in this in this time uh, with COVID? Industry runs on Viva. It's interesting. There's hundreds of thousands of people every day in life sciences that log on to Viva systems every day. I get a report every day of the different usage of our apps and it's hundreds of thousands of individuals um, and they're doing it all from home now. So it's important that our things work well and people's when they're doing it from home. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. So I will stop with my own questions. I think you've had enough of, um, of me. I've had enough of you. <laughs> <laughs> I won't leave. I'm not going anywhere. But um, moving towards audience questions, because again, we have a lot of submissions. Um, I want to give you a choice. We're doing this live. Um, so the, we've pre-selected some questions. Those people are not um, on the call yet, but we have other people who want to be promoted to panelists and be on uh, camera and ask your question um, live. So what let's go for that. Let's put them up here. Malika Hi. from where? Hey, Malika, where are you Hi, from? Hi, Peter. Hi, Anambia. I'm from Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, I was looking through the Viva website and I came across like the core values, the four co core values. So I just was wondering, is there one that stands out to you that you think is the most important out of the four of them? Yeah, the four values, they are do the right thing, customer success, employee success and speed. And they're always written in that order because it, it is mathematical. Um, they're in order of importance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, so that's so the first one's most important, do the right thing that has to do with yeah ethics, honesty, and integrity, mm -hmm. treat other people as you would wish to be treated. So that's the number one thing. And generally, we don't have to spend mm -hmm. too much time on that because it's, it's usually pretty obvious what the right thing is to do. Yeah. Um, but when it's not obvious, then, it, then that's when that becomes really important. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking it's one of the values that I hold um, personal to myself during my life, just in general. And I think that it's really important that you um, enforce that in the workplace as well. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not anything about business or anything. It's just sort of that's uh, what I feel strongly about. So you know, yeah. sometimes you kind of have to go with that. You can't really plan these things out. Now, but also I would say, as most of you are in your early 20s, I guess, um, you know, it's okay to make mistakes in life too, right? Mm -hmm. Do I look back on things that I did, even some things I did in, you know, in my, you know, before I was 22, I can look back still to this day and I can think, ah, that one wasn't right. And that one wasn't right. And that one yeah. wasn't right. Um, that's okay if you, if you make mistakes. Um, but if you hold yourself to this, do the right thing, 
um, it's good. Like, for example, you know, it wasn't so much a thing in my day, but maybe it's a more of a thing now in university, because I have kids too. I have one that's 23 and one that's mm -hmm. um, 18. It's easier to cheat on tests now than it used to be. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> it used yeah. to be a bit harder because nothing was electronic. There, it was a, it was a, there was no internet. It was just a bit harder, right? It's a little bit easier now, um, but it was still possible back when I was going to school. And, and I never cheated on a single test. And I always thought, hey, that's great. But some of you probably have. And you should know that, you know, your past is your past. You can't unwind that. And you'll probably always feel bad about that. But that's okay. Just focus on the go forward, doing the right thing to go forward, right? You learn from your past and you move on. I remember a few things that I did that I, I wish I didn't do. Um, that's okay. You, you just move on. So that's do the right thing to me. So yeah, I think, question. yeah, I think that going back to what you said, it's, it's okay to make mistakes as long as you don't repeat the same mistakes once you've learned from them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Or as long as you have to do the best you can, right? There are yeah. some mistakes that you think you'll never repeat and you do, mm -hmm. um, but you know, just, just be aware, right? Of, yeah. I think so anyway, that's why the value is there. It's not to say we will always do the right thing and make no mistake, mm -hmm. but uh, at least we know what we're trying to do. Yeah, I, I also had another question if you oh. have the time. <laughs> Okay, um, one more quick one. We get to the yeah, quick just quick a quick one. I was just I was wondering if you had prior exposure to the healthcare industry before starting Viva, or um, it was just mostly computer science programming, and then uh, no particular exposure. I had, had a lot of different stuff that I did. I had a little roofing business in high school and college, and stuff like that, and then um, mm -hmm. lots of technology exposure. And then I knew the general concept of what medicine was, but um, right. as it went in life, you know, you meet a few people, I met some people, they knew about this and, and away you go. No, so I didn't know what I was getting into at all. Okay, well, thank <laughs> you for answering, Peter. Great. It was nice talking to you. Good to talk to you, great questions. Yeah, thank you. Hey, you Daniel. Are, you're on mute still, so. Oh. Hi, Anka, hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I have two questions, um, and I guess I'll gear the first one towards Anka. Um, so, uh, as a new grad graduate, when you first joined Viva, what do you think the biggest takeaway was, uh, personal and like professionally? Very good question. Um, the biggest personal takeaway is that building a a, a reputation as a good professional and being a good corporate citizen and being respectful matters more um, than what I initially thought. It's not all about the hard skills. It is not all about the technical skills. It's how you treat others around you, how willing you are to learn from others. Um, that's been by far the biggest lesson learned for me when I joined. Um, what was the second part of your question? Um, I think it was I think you touched on the personal development, but what was like the professional one as well? Like for me, I have a lot of interests that I would like to blend together. And I guess that's part of like the question that I'm asking about if you were able to cultivate that. Absolutely. Um, I was interested in technology, even though I was not a developer, I wanted to be hands-on with technology that works and that is great, but I'm a people person. I like talking a lot. So in a way, my start at Viva, being a technical trainer was, was the perfect combination of those two things. I was hands-on, I could continue to build my technical expertise, but I was customer facing or working with every new person who joined Viva. Um, and I've managed to keep that throughout my career at Viva, throughout the different roles that I've had, I was lucky enough to keep those two aspects. Um, so I think it's absolutely possible, whether you're an associate software engineer at Viva or an associate consultant, you can combine all of these different components. It is a product and a people company. At least that's my perspective. I'm sorry, Peter. This is just my. Oh, that you know. is. I always tell, uh, you know, our Viva and team, our customers, they like our products, but they love our people. And there, there's a difference. But also, Anka, who, who noticed it in you that training might be a good job for you? Um, it was Angelique at the time, the VP of services. And it was also because we didn't have a graduate program in Europe at the time. So there was no place for me to start directly in consulting. I had to build my expertise, had to build my knowledge. Um, but it was Angelique, and I know this. Um, 
and that's you know sometimes an experienced person can get to know a young person and they can get the young person into the job where they can be fulfilled like i'll just give you a little story i you know landed in software engineering and i did well in software engineering and for whatever reason i i was bound and determined that i was not going to be a manager that was not what i was going to do and so probably for the first five or five six years of my career I was very determined on that. I wasn't going to be a manager. I moved from IBM to a different company. And then I had one person who was about 10 years older than me. And he really sat me down and said, you, you'd be a good manager. You really should do it. And I think you'll like it and try it for a year. If you don't like it, you can go back. And I tried it and yeah, it was what I was meant to do. Um, so sometimes when you're young, I think the main thing is if you focus on yourself and how I can do do things for myself and this is what I want to do and I want it just it, that's all hollow right you you won't feel good about that what you'll feel good about is how can I help the team how can I contribute that'll make you feel much better because if when you focus on yourself a you don't know what you're capable of um, but more experienced people who get to know you they know what you're capable of and also it, it just at the end of the day it won't feel good to focus on yourself Right. Who wants to do that? Um, it feels much better to focus on, man, how can I help the team? How can I contribute? And don't worry, in a good company, you'll get noticed, right? That's what happens. Was well, Steve Wozniak, for those of you technical, you know, people, he didn't focus on, God, what can I learn? How can I do that? He just like, how can I contribute? How can I get, how can I make this best thing for society? That's how you get joy and you get um, satisfaction. Picasso, he just wanted to paint the best paintings for people, right? And that's what he did. Okay, good question. Thank you for your responses. I answered something that I don't know what it was. Um, and you have one for me? Yeah, I had one for you. And it's, sorry, COVID related, if you've uh -huh. heard a lot of this, but um, it was more so long. Like, how is COVID 19? Uh, has it made like an unprecedented direction on either the usage or development of your products and or like the support and that you had to give for it, for the company has to give? Um, yeah, unprecedented. I think I would say that, yeah, there's not been a, something like it before. So it, it did change our product roadmap pretty quickly because of some of the processes inside life sciences had to change. For example, um, in the clinical trial process, the traditional process was people called clinical research associates that would work at life sciences companies would go to the research site in the hospital to inspect their documentation and how they're doing their, their clinical research in a clinical trial. That got stopped because um, the hospitals were overwhelmed and you don't want people going from one hospital to another, that type of thing. So we had to change our product roadmap very quickly to enable that to be done virtually in a HIPAA compliant way. And that was something we didn't have because it was not needed before. So there are many examples like that where we had to change our software really quickly to enable remote processes. Um, then many of our Viva people work at home, right? Consultants work at home, you can live wherever you want, salespeople work at home. But some of our development teams, those were usually in the office. So, you know, we had to change some policies and procedures around so that they could, uh, everybody could work from home well. The IT team, the people delivering computers, you know, they weren't delivering it to an office anymore. So a few things like that. But the main thing was the product roadmap. And I had to get my home office set up because I usually work in the office. So there's a micro level one. Where Definitely. Thanks for providing that. Um, because I have a brother that uses Viva products. He does oncology research. So oh, it's like <laughs> interesting. being able to hear the two different sides of how yeah. they had to adapt to it. It was interesting. Very cool. Well, good. Thank you. Good question. Thank Sounds you. good. So uh, I'm Torsten Gang. I am from Northern Idaho. I studied computer science at Brigham Young University. And my, my question is, is in the life sciences, you cover a wide range of different companies and different needs. You have everyone from doctors to pharmaceutical companies to agriculture. And 
what is the biggest change that you've had to make to fit the needs of a particular company? Biggest change that we've had to make to, sorry, you broke up there. <clears throat> the biggest change you've had to make to your services, to your platform, to fit the needs of a client. Oh, oh well, we're always, hmm, how best to answer that. One of the things that I would say is Viva, at, from a product perspective, we run to the complexity. When you're making a general piece of software, such as Google Mail or something like that. If you're Google, you're making a mail client. You don't want to run to the complexity of each different industry, right? You, Cause that'll kill you with complexity. But for Viva, we always run to the complexity of the, each individual area. So there's not one thing, but there's just many, many things. So we have software that is used to manufacture medicines, but we also have software that a patient might use when they're in the clinical trial. Those are very, very different. Um, we have software that you, that's used by pharmaceutical sales reps in Japan. It's a very specific, very specific business process that you do when you introduce a new drug for the first time into a hospital in Japan. It's covered by a lot of regulation and very specific workflow. Well, we have to have that in our software. So, uh, yeah, it's all different. Viva doesn't have one product. The way to think about Viva is we have many, many products. And they're all very specific. So that's, uh, that's one thing to know about Viva. We have a system for doing that. We have um, what we call product management that figures out what the product should do. We have, and talks to the customers. We have engineering that builds a product. We have um, sales engineers and salespeople that would sell the product. And then we have consultants, right? And part of the consulting development program, they would help the customers implement and get value out of that product. And then we have a support team as well and a marketing team. Lots of different functions in Viva. Good, very good question. Thank you, Torsten. Thank you, Torsten. Sorry about that. Uh, um, hi, Andrea, hi, how are you? Hi, here. hi Anka. Um, I'm Ambria Bates. I went to uh, Penn State Harrisburg. I graduated this past May. Um, oh, you, you went a little quiet there. I didn't hear where you went to? Penn State Harrisburg. Okay, got it. Um, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I graduated with a management degree. Yeah. So my question for P for Peter, you is, um, because I graduated with a management degree, I wasn't sure like how I could fit into Viva, and mm -hmm. although my passion was um, and still is medicine, um, I went to a science and technology high school. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a neonatologist. That was my my dream job, I guess, when I was younger but I just ended up going the business route. Um, but I always wanted to see how I could mix the two together, work somewhere that had, could, could combine the two. So I was just wondering like, what is, is this a possibility for me? Like would this, what skills would I need, you know, outside of management that, you know, would, would help me add to the Viva? Yeah, well, I would say, um, no, I'm, I'm 55 now, so I've sort of seen a thing or two, right? And, um, you know, you, you sort of are who you are. And, you know, what you studied, maybe that's from information, but it didn't really change who you are, right? right. I, I studied computer science. I'd still be who I am if I studied physics or economics or English. You know, I'd still be, that doesn't really define me or change me per se. So I would just recognize that you, you are who you are. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about your degree or not your degree. That's just some stuff you've learned. And that's sort of okay. pretty, pretty, pretty minor in the grand scheme of things. So I think that if you just focus in on, you know, if you, if you have people that know you really well, like sometimes parents know you really well, sometimes it can be older siblings or older cousins or Sometimes it can be a teacher. There'll, there'll often be people that know you quite well, that maybe even know you at this point. They may know you better than you know yourself sometimes, right? Because they have that perspective. Yeah. So if you, if you ask them, hey, what types of careers do you think might be good for me, et cetera? And if you ask these questions and you start listening, um, they might give you good advice. Because, you know, see, it's hard for me because I don't actually know you. That would take, that would, yeah, I would love to get to know you, but it would take more time, right? It can't, can't do that in 30 seconds, right? Every right. human being is 
more complex. You absolutely cannot learn about a human in 30 seconds. But these other people may have seen you over multiple years, right? They might know something about you because and and might be able to to guide you and and then i would say for yourself if you focus on i i don't know if there's a dream job etc i i think that's hard i i think if you focus on where can you contribute a lot and, and what kind of work you can do well you'll usually end up liking the work that you end up that you can do well because it's sort of um self-gratifying other people see you doing that work well and they're thinking oh man Ambria is doing great and you're, you're liking that feeling and it's a way to develop self-worth so um, I'm sorry if I, I'm not giving you very specific but it's just too nuanced right I'd have to know you a lot better um, and I would say you know I want to just you know if I can give you anything it's just give you confidence in yourself right you are who you are uh, you're gonna be fine and there's a Ken Frazier, he's the, um, he's the CEO of one of our biggest customers, Merck. And he said the advice his, and he's a bit older than I am, he's 65, he's seen a lot in his life. He said the advice his father gave him was, his name is Ken Frazier, but I guess his, his dad called him Kenny, you know, when he was a young guy. Yeah. So he said, Kenny, what other people think about you is none of your damn business. <laughs> Right. So you just have that confidence, you know, that you're, you're going to be fine. Okay. Um, and you, and you will be fine. Thank you. Question. Oh, Samuel, you're on mute. Hey guys, uh, hey. Peter Anka, thanks for having me. Uh, so I graduated from Florida State University, uh, computer science, and I have two quick questions. Very good uh, university. Florida State, where is that? What city is it in? It's in Tallahassee. Okay, yeah. Good yeah. And a good degree. I got one too, computer science, good degree. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun time. Um, but anyways, uh, I kind of want to piggyback off what Torsten was uh, asking about earlier. Um, like you were saying, you guys have many, many specific products, lots of moving parts and uh, departments. And I was wondering how, what challenges came up with the whole work from home situation and you know, kind of from your perspective, what that transition was like. Yeah. Well, many, um, let's say in the United States, I would guess in the United, if we just focus in on the United States, I would guess probably two thirds of the people in the U.S. from Viva were already working at home because right. they're in their sales people, consultants, et cetera. Now the engineers generally were, were not, probably less than 5% of people. Um, I don't think there was any particular thing that was a challenge working from home per se. It more had to do with the home life. So for example, some of the most challenging is, okay, you have a person, um, now they have to work from home. Uh, might be a married couple. They, they have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and a 12-year-old. And now they have to be a teacher and a tutor and a daycare and everything, and they're both working. Like This is a yeah. tremendous amount of stress. And maybe their parent is, have an older parent that they're worried about and the older parents in a nursing home, nobody can visit them, they're feeling isolated. So these, these were, it, so it wasn't the working at home per se, but it was the compounding effect of the, the support and social structure that, that people had in the schools and, and things like that. That's, man, then they were doing double duty. So that was really hard. And in general, what we have a philosophy is this COVID, um, affects different Viva team members differently. So mm -hmm. for some, it's going to hit them very hard because of this, you know, other social things going on, right? Yeah. And for some, like me, it's just mild inconvenience. I like to be in the office. Um, I have to work from home. Okay, I, whatever. And I, I like to see people. I don't get to see people. I have a little less energy, whatever. I'll get through it because I got to help those other people. Right, that are, right. That are really having a tough time. So COVID's, Working from home, no big deal. COVID itself is a big deal. Right. And you, know, I just you could want... be living a Viva person in that small apartment in New York, right? And yeah. And now you got three kids in there, you don't have enough space and stuff like that. That's kind of tough. Yeah, I would imagine. Thankfully, I'm just on my own now. But I also wanted to ask, uh, I was looking at Viva Vault uh, before the uh, 
the webinar and I saw you guys offer some machine learning services to customers for their data science purposes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how Viva kind of stays ahead of the game in terms of academic research, in terms of, you know, keep staying on the cutting edge with machine learning and saying, yeah. Um, let's see, I, I will answer that question, but I'll, I will step back a little bit. Um, okay. <laughs> business, business is not that hard. Probably the hardest thing in business is to keep focusing on the very basic things that are hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, that's how companies generally, when they fall down, they fall down because they don't do that. Very few companies fall down because they don't. It's a technical thing. So, right. I, you know, the main thing in business is really, really simple. Um, stay whether you're mowing lawns or whether you've got a small machine shop or doing software, stay close to your customers. Listen to your customers. Realize that you have to add value to your customers. Always be customer facing instead of inward or technology or policy procedures. Always do that. And then, and have good relationships with your customers because then you, you won't get behind because if machine learning starts to be very important from them, they will also let you know that. Right. They will also let you know that. So Viva, um, we, we talked about a first value, do the right thing, which is pretty straightforward. That's about morals, you know, no lying, cheating, stealing, that kind of thing. Um, the second is about customer success. And that means for, it has three parts. There's the people that work in life sciences, like the, the one person there, their brother was, using Viva software, right. there are people that are implementing our products. So we, we have to be good for those people, projects on time, software good. And then there's the companies in life science, Pfizer, Novartis, et cetera. We have to deliver ROI for them. And then there's the industry overall that, hey, we have to help make healthcare better for the world. So as long as we do that, we'll be fine. Um, and we have a lot of, especially in that technical area, now I'll get back to the very specific thing about the technical. In that technical area, we have good technologists in Viva and it mm -hmm. organically happens. If you have a few hundred great technologists that have freedom, it's impossible that some major meaningful trend is gonna escape your notice. Right, they, they got eyes on the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's just sort of this collective, right, that, that happens. Uh, I guess if you had a very stifling company that didn't let anybody have any ideas, then you might be in trouble. But ideas right. will normally come from the leaf nodes. Actually, in technology, real ideas about technology, stuff, it actually comes from the engineer, et cetera. It doesn't come from the engineer's manager's manager or manager, right? right. So, yeah. Uh, I would also say then, big decision is there's tons of ideas. The most important decisions are actually about what not to do. Because right. when you can decide what not to do, which nobody claps for that, right? Nobody's happy when you tell their idea, hey, we're not doing that. But what happens is then you can really focus on the things you are saying yes to. And really, so that the hard decisions and important ones are actually, it's not what to do. It's actually what not to do. Right. Well, thank you. All right. Very good. Excellent question there. Thank you everyone for your questions. I know we're at the top of the hour, so I think we'll stop with questions for now, but I know that on the chat, um, we said that for any other questions, I'm happy to collect them. So there's my email on the chat and absolutely reach out and um, I'll, I'll be happy to help out. Um, Peter, again, thank you so, so much for sharing your insight, talking about product and career with everyone on this call. Um, and lastly, everyone who is on the call will have a follow-up email from us and from the Way Up team. Um, inviting you to schedule an interview with either our engineering development program or consulting development program if you're interested um, in starting that journey and that adventure with us. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Uh, it was fun for me. Thanks for the good questions and energy. I, I love to do it. Sorry we weren't in the, uh, you know, in the, in the dorm room in the college somewhere, and, uh, but maybe next time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thank you.